title of the talk today, um, the Indian River Lagoon, you can observe a lot by just watching. And um, I'll explain what that means. And a uh, quick overview of the lagoon followed introducing you to the Indian River Lagoon Observatory concept, or ERLO, and then talking about our net network of environmental sensors, or ERLON. I'm going to tell you something I'm going to call three ERLON short stories, three little snippets of things we've observed, and then talk about some of the things we're going to do moving forward. And I thought rather than saving acknowledgments for the end, uh, I want to do it up front because it's really important you realize there's a lot of people who work on this project. Here they are. Some of them are in the room. Maybe, maybe most of them are in the room. Um, and I haven't decided if I'm going to use the mouse, which I think everybody can see okay. Um, but Kristen Davis is here. Um, she basically um, runs things uh, on a day-to-day -day basis for our network and environmental sensors. And John Richardson, day-to-day, -day handles our field work. And I think when we hired him, we said on average it'll be two, three days. Well, it's really anywhere from two to five days that we have field work every, every, every week. And I'd say the average is somewhere between three and four. So it's quite very field intensive what you're seeing. Sarah, day-to-day, uh, -day is responsible for all of our analytical work, our QAQC. Brian is responsible for a lot of the data work, especially some of the things I'll talk about later in terms of trying to automate the data. John Hart has been with me for several years. Um, he and Lisa and Patrick are all called biological scientists, which kind of means they can pretty much do anything. And they, they flex around from different uh, jobs. Lisa and Patrick do weekly uh, monitoring that Chris and I started about 12 years ago, working on seagrasses and water quality. Emily is um, a relatively recent graduate from our Semester by the Sea program last year. And she, she works with the Erlon folks, as well as the Susan Larimore's group. Liberta, I don't know if Liberta's here right now, but Liberta is a volunteer who was an early employee of Harbor Branch who came back here to volunteer after she retired from all their other work. And then Ben, Jeff, and Dave are all in our engineering group. Ben had a lot to do with designing the sites uh, in terms of how we deploy them. And Jeff and uh, Dave do quite a lot of the fabrication work that's required and also have helped a lot on the field work. So it's a lot of people. It's a big job. A lot of people, when we first started talking about this, they thought, well, you just buy the sensors, you put them in the water, and it works forever. You don't have to do anything. And that, that's far from the case. I also want to up front thank the mention that it takes a lot of funding to do this. And um, started off with an investment by Harbor Branch. And then our foundation um, was very generous to suggest that we try to expand the network locally. And we've gotten support uh, for a number of years from the Save Our Seas, the Shark Plate. Um, and those funds are granted also through Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute Foundation. And we have uh, funding for our southern network from the Department of Environmental Protection. And we have one of our sites funded by the Rivers Issue Team, which operates under the South Florida Water Management District. So it does take quite a lot of uh, teamwork, uh, not only day-to-day -day work, but also just keeping the, the money going. And we've been very, very lucky that we have uh, such good sponsors. So I want to thank everybody for that. And for anybody who has a shark plate in particular, some of your money actually goes to what you're seeing today and a lot of other really good causes here at Harbor Ranch. So many of you know the lagoon, but at least initially, I'm going to assume since some of you are here for the first time, um, we should talk a little bit about the lagoon. Well, the lagoon is a really cool place. You know, the first time I came for an interview here for my, my first postdoc, my first came, uh, you know, I had never seen such a place like the Lagoon, and one of the very first things I did was I got to walk behind the Johnson House here on campus, and that was the first time I laid eyes on the Lagoon. I wasn't sure that I'd ever work in it. Uh, it turned out I've worked in it quite a lot. And it's really a long, skinny estuary. The natural average depth is only about five and a half feet. Anything deeper is almost always um, artificially done. And it goes up to Ponce de Leon, so north of the Cape, Mosquito Lagoon, very interesting place. The Banana River, which is near the Cape, this side of Merritt Island, goes all the way down to Jupiter Inlet. Okay? And right now, there's Harbor Ranch research going on pretty much all throughout the lagoon. Uh, you probably oftentimes have heard that we have a lot of biodiversity. Biodiversity just means types of life. So we have a lot of life in the lagoon, a lot of different kinds of things. And a lot of that is because we have all these interesting habitats. 
which, by the way, are all plant-dominated, which is what, of course, I work on. So seagrass beds, mangroves, and tidal marshes are a really important part of that biodiversity, and that's really kind of what I'm interested in. If we look at the whole watershed, so not just the estuary, but the water that drains in, which is what um, a lot of the managers look at is the whole watershed, we have over 2,000 plant species. We also have over 2,000 animal species, including 700 fish species. So one of the first ways or what, times where people realized how biodiverse this was was when Grant Gilmore and his work early on here at Harbor Branch found these large numbers of fish species, far more than anybody had thought, and very unusual for an estuarine system. Um, we have uh, more than 300 species of birds. We have over 50 threatened or endangered species in the Indian River Lagoon. So this really is a hot spot for biodiversity um, in, in, our, in our whole country. So maybe you're not so interested in, you know, the life. Maybe you're interested more on the, the um, you know, the financial or the ec economic implications of the lagoon. Well, there too, it's really, really important. It's about $8 billion a year, and that's about one-seventh of the region's economy. So it's not trivial at all. And for 25 years, it's been designated an estuary of national significance by the EPA. And uh, uh, there's only 20-some spots like that uh, in, the, in the country. Our fisheries are about $30 million annually, and that's about half of the fish harvest for the east coast of Florida. Um, it used to be higher, but that's what it is now. And again, a lot of my work on this got into it because I was interested in plants, and I got interested in seagrasses. And basically, for a long time, I would just have to explain, well, I study this. Not, I know you guys don't care about seagrass, but you do care about fish. And maintaining a seagrass-based system has been the way the lagoon has been managed for about 25 years. And that's why seagrasses are considered to be such an important species, because it's such a, it has a, it's a great nursery value and habitat value for so many of the fishes and the other animal life. So good water quality is critical to maintaining seagrass habitat. And that's kind of how I got into some of the work that we'll talk about today. Like all the estuaries in the country and in the world, probably, we have critical issues. And you've heard a lot about these in the lecture series, and you've heard about some of them from me in the past. Excessive freshwater release, which I will talk about today. It's been talked about some other times. Degradation of water quality, contaminants. You heard some talks about like mercury inputs, for example, in the lagoon earlier in the series. Uh, loss of habitat. Um, you know, all the, all the uh, modifications we made, putting in causeways, putting in uh, finger canals, and so on, all have had an impact uh, on the lagoon. Most of that has stopped. Uh, decline of fisheries. I could show you pictures from, you know, 80 years ago with the large numbers and quantities and types of fishes. We don't see those large fishes anymore. They're basically gone. Um, you've heard some talks about emerging diseases in marine mammals, and a lot of that work has really been driven by a number of people here at Harbor Branch. And you'll hear more about that, I'm sure, in the future as well. So uh, about six years ago, seven years ago now, we started the concept of Indian River Lagoon Observatory. It's something I kind of wanted to do for a long time. But sometimes the stars just have to line up a certain way. And the goal of this, frankly, is just we need to better understand the lagoon. Uh, we need to do a better job with acquiring and disseminating data. And we need to better manage it. So sustainable management is just we want it to be here in a good condition for a long time. I wanted to talk a little bit about the concept of the observatory. And I said, well, let's talk about environmental observatories in general. Because a lot of times we say observatory, we're thinking you know, a telescope is involved, um, and so on. Basically, environmental observatories help track and understand changes in the environment and use long-term data, and really, uh, just like I described for the lagoon. And there's observatories, other environmental observatories, for example, with the North Pole. It's kind of a, a, a pretty special place to have one. But there's a lot of long-term data. And as we know, things are changing very rapidly um, in our polar areas. So what really drives them is what drives me. I really just want to understand nature. That's all I ever wanted to do with my career. And, but they're not new. You are all great observers of nature. You know, we're all talking about, you know, well, it really is a very unusual year with the weather. Today is going to be the all-time hottest temperature where we are in our, in our part of the world. Um, we look at other changes that we, we've seen. Um, I would argue that you can go back to places like Stonehenge, which was really set up as an observatory, really, to monitor 
the changing seasons and the angle of the sun and so on, and they used it to guide them along in some of their agricultural decisions. And, um, you know, that's a model of what it really looked like. But um, you can go back in time and see that we're not now just thinking of the need to do this. We've always wanted to understand nature and keep track of things and predict things. So increasingly modern observatories are relying on networks of sensors, which really give us the unbelievable amount of data at temporal, which means time, so we get more data more often, and spatial scale, so we're able to get more data over bigger parts of the world. And this is something that's been fairly new, just really in the last you know, decade or so. And with all this additional data and observations, we are getting a much better understanding of environmental variability. And this is important not just to people like me, but to everybody. So to students and teachers and research managers and just to, I think, the average person. Um, and the goal really is that this all leads to better policy and enhancing um, our understanding of the natural, natural environment. Uh, more and more people are realizing that the environment and the economy are not different. They, they blend together, as I showed you before with some of the statistics for the Inner River Lagoon. So let's talk about the Inner River Lagoon Observatory. And I always like to say there's race, basically three parts. One is long-term multidisciplinary ecosystem-based approach. And I've talked about some of that in the past, some of the seagrass work we're doing. Um, and there's a lot of other people here at Harbor Branch that have presented in the last couple months, last several months, um, on their work, which all falls under that umbrella of uh, multidisciplinary ecosystem-based approach. Collaboration among organizations. Harbor Branch has really taken a leadership role now with uh, working with other uh, institutions, both universities and agencies. We have an annual in the year symposium here where 300, three, more than 300 people come for a day. We have like 70 or 80 talks, not just one. And um, it really has become uh, quite a, a way to get everyone working together uh, better than we have in the past. And there's some other examples I could give you there. What I really want to talk today about, though, is a network of advanced observing stations, how technology is a really key ingredient uh, to Erlo. And this all came, came back from something that uh, we started 12 years ago, which I alluded to earlier, which is working nearby in Vero Beach here. And we had these canals that drain water into the lagoon, and that water flows south right past Harbor Branch. And here I am thinking, wow, won't this be a good place to start to do some monitoring? because this part of the lagoon was actually poorly known, even though we, we knew that it had some serious water quality issues that were not well documented. If we look just at things like salinity, this is some of our long-term data, and you can see it bounces all around. It can get very, very fresh at times. can get very, very salty at times, saltier than the ocean. And basically, to me, increasingly, the story is not an average number, but how it changes through time and why it changes through time and what changes with these, these changes in freshwater inputs. And as you can guess, that a lot of these dips are all tied to things like hurricanes and tropical storms and unusual rain events. And on average, we, we have a named storm that comes close, or close enough that we have to start securing all our stuff and thinking about evacuation about every two and a half years. Most of the time that we've been doing this work, we've actually been in a drought. Last year we were not. This year we are in a drought, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So the Indian Lagoon Observatory Network Environmental Sensors, or just ERLON, is uh, what we're going to really focus on now. And uh, that's our flagship station, the one right down the channel here at Harbor Branch. That's where this project started. And basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to have an observation and prediction network in the lagoon that gives us real time. So in other words, you all can pull your phones out, get, get the reading. Um, in two minutes, we have a 4 o'clock reading. It posts about 20 minutes after the hour, and that's going to tell us what the conditions are at 10 strategic locations in our study area. These are really high-quality, accurate data. That's what some of the folks that I identified earlier, that's what their job is, to make this the best possible water quality and weather data available. Um, these are the things that we measure. So they're all water quality parameters. Um, I don't think I'm going to really go into them in great detail. Um, some of you will know most of these things, but they include all the basic physical parameters like temperature and salinity and dissolved oxygen. You all know 
alkaline. All animals need dissolved oxygen to breathe in the water. pH, how acid it is. Since I'm a plant guy, I really care about the attenuation of light, what reduces light, why the water is not as clear as it could be for, for the seagrass. So things like turbidity, the particles, or watercolor, or CDOM, or chlorophyll A, which is the phytoplankton pigment, all of these reduce light levels um, coming to, to the seagrasses. Uh, and it has, they have other impacts as well, but that's kind of my perspective. And then the most exciting thing to me when we did this, and probably one of the reasons I decided to do such a crazy thing, is that nitrate and phosphate, those are um, uh, required elements for all growth, um, especially for plants. They need, they need these kinds of things. Uh, but as you know, they're also pollutants when we have too much nitrate and phosphate. So it's a very double-edged sword, very challenging. We also have the typical weather parameters, uh, like temperature, humidity, pressure. PAR is light, um, but is expressed in a way that's relative to what organisms see, not necessarily what our eye sees, but it's very closely related. And things like rain and wind parameters. Um, the, one of the key instruments is called uh, a LOBO, a Land Oceanographic Biogeochemical Observatory. Here's what one of them looks uh, like. And some of the key things that I, I'll point out here is this thing here called the storex. It's basically the brain, if you will. Um, it's a data logger. Everything is connected to it. Um, the WQMX measures most of the parameters that I already described to you. A lot of this is done optically. So on one end, we measure chlorophyll and color and turbidity. And on the other end, we measure some other things. Hidden behind here, out of view, is a SUNA, which measures, again, using an optical technology, uh, measures nitrate, which is present in a very tiny amount of all of the ions in the seawater, but it detects them. And again, this is, uh, to me, was, was the big revolution that happened. Uh, this is the only thing that's actually done with chemistry, and I call it chemistry in a can. That's where we get our phosphorus analysis. It's actually a, a micro uh, scale way that we do things in the lab for many, many years. Um, and that's what takes 20 minutes because that's actually a chemical analysis. And that's why that reading now, if you look and check, it's now up for 4 o'clock. Um, this is what it looks like on the way out to the field. Uh, we have used various types of um, approaches. Uh, we used to pr primarily rely on taping everything and painting it. We rely a lot more on copper materials such as you see here on the cables. Fouling is our biggest problem. Two years ago when I last presented an ERLO, um, and Kristen and Ben also presented with us, we discussed some of those challenges with fouling. Um, you can refer back to that. It's on the website. Uh, a typical location looks something like this, on the weather station above. Uh, we use, except for our site right here, we work with the Coast Guard to get permission to use their sites. It's uh, very useful. If we had to get our own um, pilings in, it takes uh, at least a year and requires at least three agencies to approve it. If the Coast Guard approves it, we can do, and we follow um, what we've agreed to do, uh, they can approve it much quicker, and you do not mess with a Coast Guard marker. It's uh, a federal offense. So I kind of like that. I kind of like that we have protection like that. The actual um, LOBO, the instrumentation, in, for most of what we talk about, the water quality, the weather stations up here, and everything else is, is uh, submerged. This is what it looks like above water. So we have everything powered by a solar panel. Uh, we have a weather station up here. Um, you see the antenna here, which will signal uh, once an hour to send the data back to, back to a server. That server is available to us right away here at Harbor Branch, but it's also available to anybody in the world, any place. You can go online and you can get it. That's where you want to go online to get the website. Uh, we have some cards if you want them later to take, but all you got to do is Google Harbor Branch in the Lagoon or Harbor Branch water quality, and it comes right up on the top of your list. And um, this is what the, the, uh, the home page looks like. You can get current weather or current water quality very quickly. But the thing I like the most is you click on LoboViz, and it gives you access to all of our data we've collected since the beginning of the project. And you can download that data and do anything you want. And I'm going to show you some graphs coming up that each graph on average took five seconds to get. I mean, once you know what you want, it takes about five seconds, not even that. And you can get any data you want, and then you can quickly download it and do what you want with it. Uh, why are we doing this? Well, I already told you my personal reason for doing it. Uh, I want to understand things better in the, in, the, in the nearby estuaries. But I think what it's going to give us is that unprecedented environmental data that all of us need. 
to have to better understand the lagoon. And it's going to be uh, readily available to anybody who wants it. Um, we're going to be able to follow uh, long-term changes and short-term events. And there's another group that's doing similar work on the west coast of Florida. So imagine, for example, the day that big storm does come through the center of the state and we have massive overflow of Lake Okeechobee and discharges to both canals. We're going to have similar technology. Or just imagine now we want to compare what's going on with the drought on both, both sides of the state. So matching it up in that way, I think, was a very good idea um, that we had. Um, this all leads to better management, so all the agencies that are involved um, can use the data, and it uh, will make for better decision-making than we've had in the past. A lot of that is, is, is used, a lot of that better decision-making will be because people will use this data in environmental models, take it all, and try to explain, you know, what happens if we change certain kinds of um, things we're doing on land, what might we expect to see improvements on in the lagoon. And then we can document it by the monitoring that we're doing. And lastly, I think very importantly too, people need to learn about the lagoon. And so we are very uh, education outreach. And this I count as an outreach event, all, all of you who showed up today for, for this. This is, this is really important to us. We, unless, unless we have people like yourself interested in the lagoon, we're never going to uh, solve some of the issues. So as a scientist, some of the things I'm interested in is how do freshwater discharges and runoff from land impact water quality in our estuaries. I'm interested in nutrients. I said that earlier, nitrate and phosphate. I said I'm interested in flight attenuators because I really want to know how does that impact seagrass. What about algal blooms? You heard some really good talks this year on algal blooms. You heard several lectures be before this one talk about the data they were using. I think it was five or six lectures referred to the data. Um, and then I'm very interested in the interaction of freshwater discharges, but also the ocean water that comes from the inlet. That is really critical to understand the biodiversity in the lagoon. So here's a map of our 10 sites. They go all the way from Sebastian down to um, St. Lucie Estuary. And um, we started with one site here, um, Linkport, which is another name for our local uh, site here. Um, and it's been used historically by a lot of the scientists that have worked in the area. And if we just kind of blow this up, this is right at the end of our canal. And then uh, that was started with funding from Harbor Branch um, directly. And then, as I mentioned, the foundation invited us to uh, work in the local uh, counties, so St. Lucie County and Indian River County. And um, we put the next site down here at Fort Pierce, just north of the inlet um, near uh, uh, Taylor, Taylor Creek, where there is freshwater influence, and we have the biggest uh, inlet in our lagoon system right here at Fort Pierce. And then we put one on the southern end of Vero Beach, which captures all of the freshwater flows coming from these canals that all of us in the New York County know about. And then we put the next one up near, again, another source of freshwater inputs, the St. Sebastian River, and the next nearest inlet um, to the north, uh, Sebastian Inlet. And these all came online. Um, the first one was in 2013. The other ones came in at the very end of 2014 and 2015. So now we're starting to get a reasonable amount of data, a reasonable amount of experience with, with these sites. And then, because of what happened um, in uh, 2013 and a very wet year with a lot of issues with uh, the St. Lucie Estuary, we were able to get um, a state appropriation that is um, administered to us by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. And we set up this, what we call the Southern Network. And uh, this includes uh, the South Fork of the St. Lucie Estuary and the North Fork. These are the two parts. So at the base of each, the water flows this way and this way as it goes downstream. We have one at the Mid-Estuary that's right by the Roosevelt Bridge. That's downtown Stewart right there. And that flows out to an area we call the Crossroads, which is the station right here, IRL, SLE. It's called the Crossroads because it's the intersection of the St. Lucie Estuary, the channel out to the inlet, and of course, the Indian River Lagoon, north to south. And we also have like a reference location north of that uh, site in Jensen Beach. Now, most of the flow of the St. Lucie Estuary, 91% uh, of it actually, and Dr. Ned Smith somewhere here in the audience, he's one of the ones who calculated that. Most of the water flow that comes out of the St. Lucie Estuary goes right out here. And we'll talk about that later. And only 9% goes north. But when we set this up, our technical advisory group said, we really would like to know what is the impact of this further up 
um, into leaning over the lagoon. So that's actually uh, why the stations are where they are. Most of these came online in 2015. We had one final station, the one that was funded by South Florida Water Management District. I wrote the proposal first, they got funded last. That's just the way it works sometimes. And we ended up putting that one here in the South Fork also. We call it South Fork 2. This is right um, uh, where the water from the Ocacho Lake Okeechobee discharges into the San Luis Estuary. And fortuitously, the timing of this was, was excellent, as you'll see with some of our data. So I'm going to try to show a video next um, of what it looks like to install a station. And I really do this to, to show you that it's really a team effort and some of the skill sets that are involved. So um, this, again, will focus on um, one of our sites down here in the uh, St. Lucie Estuary. And you can see uh, John and that's Dave and Ben right there. Um, they did most of the fabrication and most of the hard work putting it up. You can see we actually hoist everything up. We have a, a special boat for this uh, that we use. You can see the pieces coming together, uh, the solar panel. And um, Ben and Al is doing some of the final connections there. Um, that's our umbilical. Our umbilical is basically the, the cables that connect um, everything above ground to below ground, the power and so on. That is the Lobo being deployed. So one of the really cool things was when I first saw how Lobos were being deployed on the West Coast, they put a diver in the water. And I said, I don't think we want to do that because we have Harbor Branch engineers that are going to figure out a better way. And the better way was basically to use that process that you just saw where we basically just come up and, and roll it down. The data, as I say, are available uh, every hour. There's Kristen monitoring data. She does that every day. This is what some of the data would look like if you wanted to download it. Again, it's a very, very simple uh, process, and that's the way the, uh, the screen used to look back then. And you can look at relationships, like I, like I just saw. So that's our boat, and like I said, these guys work hard in the field, and they're off to another station just like that. So that's my quick, uh, quick look in the field for you. So I'm going to tell you three short stories. And so I'm thinking, well, what do I want to say? So we talked two years ago. Two years ago, we hadn't put anything into the south. We said, we think we're going to have some money, and we're going to put the southern network in. And I said, well, what, what, what is the most significant things? What are the things that people have asked me about the most in the past year? Okay. And that's, what I came, that's why I came up with these three stories. So how many people were here during Hurricane Matthew? And how many of you live here in the wintertime, but you have property here? Okay, a lot of people. So this is the story of Hurricane Matthew real quick. And I'm going to show you our weather station data because a lot of people – don't remember that we also have really good weather station. So um, you may remember this was supposed to be a Category 4 storm. It was supposed to come ashore right here. Those of us who had lived through two hurricanes three weeks apart in 20, 20, 2004 said, this will be much worse if that's really true. And all the predictions were quite ugly. And so um, we had decided long ago that when we have these kinds of events, we're going to keep all the instrumentation there. We may lose some of the above water stuff. But we have battery power that will last for at least two days, and we think the data from such an event are critical. So we just kept everything in place. And as you know, at the last, uh, almost the last minute, like the last couple of hours, the storm stayed out to sea, went north, and most of the major damage was to the north. So how bad was Hurricane Matthew, really? Um, well, sorry. The maximum sustained winds here at all of our sites were very short and was only about 50 miles an hour. So it never really had even uh, maximum tropical storm strength. Hurricane force winds are 74. So we, we never saw sustained winds like that. So really, um, I'm always amazed by all the people now who have moved here since 2004 and say, well, we survived Hurricane Matthew. Nah, he didn't really survive a hurricane. <laughs> Sorry, you're going to have to punch your card some other time. But it's important that, it's important that people realize this. Um, and what about the wind gusts? Because, you know, once, once, once it was obvious it wasn't going to be the big one, uh, the weather station would only talk about gusts. They would never tell you sustained winds anymore. So actually the, the gusts, the very quick burst of, of wind, were stronger, of course. But even still, they were below hurricane force wind. They ranged from 58 to 73 miles per hour. These are at our stations that have weather, st have, have weather stations. And actually, you, if you tease this out, you can actually see that, yeah, the one that had 73 was the one closest to the ocean. The one that had 58 is furthest away. So you can see very gradient. 
So when we have these really major events, we're going to be able to couple it with very localized water, um, water quality and, and meteorological data. And I think that's a really cool thing. And it's not something I, I think we thought that much about. I thought, well, it's all going to be about water quality. So what about um, surge? They had said if it came ashore, we were going to have six to eight foot surge. The island would have gone, the barrier island would have been underwater. It would have been worse than, than 12 years ago. And, um, and uh, in fact, uh, we didn't have much surge. So this is actually depth going up and down. And you can see this is when we actually had the storm. And it was only uh, a very small amount of height. Um, and uh, that's a really good thing. And so again, the thought occurred to me um, that when we do have a major storm, and for those of you, for example, are living up north, or maybe you live here year round and you decide to go to Orlando, and you want to know what's really happening at home. Well, all you got to do is plug in to this data set, as I did, because I did go to Orlando, because I knew it was a big one. I wasn't going to do it. And also, I know I needed to be functional. And Kristen actually decided the same thing. We were in different places, different parts of the state, and we were both watching the storm from afar. Next time we have a storm here, I invite you to watch the storm with us, wherever you are. And what about the rain? Uh, I told you it wasn't that big of an event for wind, really. And it turned out it wasn't that big of an event, um, really, for rain. So this is, again, from our weather stations. We had two to four inches. It really was not a very wet storm, OK? Um, so those are usually the two big concerns, how, how much precipitation and flooding, uh, how, much, how much are we going to get with the wind. What about in the water? Well, this is turbidity. We typically see, as you see, turbidity is right down here. And we sometimes parse, you know, well, boy, it's really high right here. OK, but now storm events really take on new meaning when you actually monitor data. Nobody can go out and monitor data real time any other way without remote instrumentation. We cannot send boats out into these kinds of conditions to take traditional grab samples. And you can see totally what a huge peak in turbidity we had at our sites. Um, these are the sites closest to us, closer to where we're speaking today. So it caused a large turbidity pulse in the IRL. And I think it's these large pulses of things that happen during storm events that could be really, really important things that happen in the lagoon. What about salinity? So that fresh water, what did it do? You can see this is the up and down cycle, some of our sites by the inlet. This you can see the numbers are all real low. This is the period of time that we had low salinities. In fact, we had, very low, we had low salinities just for a very short period of time. So it was really just a short term impact. Very different than what 2004 was. 2004, we had much lower salinities for a much longer time, and it totally flushed out the lagoon. So story two. What about 2016? Well, everybody wants to know about Lake Okeechobee discharges. Um, Lake Okeechobee discharges didn't start in 2016. They've been going on for a long time, since the 1930s. And you can go back and read local accounts of them. And you can read about the concerns in the 1930s about how that was going to impact the estuary. But for those of you who don't know about this, this is the St. Lucie estuary. This is the C44 canal. This is Lake Okeechobee. Um, and another important part of the story is that a lot of the water that is in Lake Okeechobee is not water that came from any of the surrounding counties. It came from far to the north, all the way. The, the watershed runs all the way up to um, just south of Disney World in Orlando. So it runs through a large area. And in the 1960s and early 70s, this was uh, made into a straight canal. It had been a meandering uh, water body like you see over here. But it was replaced with this basically to move water quickly. And that totally changed the hydrology of the center of the state. So any pollutants, any nitrogen and phosphorus that's in the center of the state from any of these lands end up in Lake Okeechobee. And then when there's a lot of it, the Army Corps has to discharge it. It does this through a series of uh, locks at different locations. And this shows uh, dark black water, as they call it, flowing out the St. Lucie uh, estuary uh, into the um, Indian River Lagoon and then out to the Atlantic Ocean. And you can actually possibly see that, that most of that water most of the time goes south. It flows over the St. Lucie Reef, which you know Dr. Dasha Voss's lab has talked about in the past here in the lecture series in terms of the, this being the northernmost part of the Florida reef track and having some significant impacts there, or they're at least looking for the impacts and, um, and so on. Uh, 
What was very different in 2016 is that we had um, very large cyanobacteria blooms. These are blue-green algae. And uh, Jim Sullivan talked about this a couple weeks ago in uh, March. They started, this is a NASA photo, and uh, they started in a large part of Lake Okeechobee. And when, the, when this was in the middle of the discharges, and you can see they get into St. Lucie Estuary uh, near some of the houses there and into uh, places where people like to go boating and ecotourism and so on. Um, cyanobacteria have a lot of toxic uh, compounds, and Jim talked about that uh, very well, so I'm not going to repeat a lot of what he said. Uh, especially when the wind uh, aggregates these things and the currents, you can get large quantities of decaying uh, cyanobacteria. Hydrogen sulfide, that's the decaying smell, the rotten egg smell that we get. Um, plus you get um, toxins from the, the blue-green algae. So if you have respiratory situations, uh, you're compromised already, you know, you are, you are at uh, potentially a significant risk. What did we see uh, during this uh, event um, with our, our Lobos? And what I want to show you here is the salinity record uh, that started when we first deployed them and running until about early November of last year. And the first thing I want to point out is, see this dip here? This was a big dip in salinity. Lake Okeechobee was not discharging then. That was all local runoff. Some of you may remember in September of 2015, we had a pretty significant rain event. Um, there was a lot of localized flooding. And this is all watershed discharge. And my point here is you can see how quickly in an event like that, with no Lake Okeechobee influences at all, you can get this incredible decline in salinity, how fast this whole system becomes a freshwater system. It's no longer an estuary, it's a freshwater body. But you can see how quickly it recovers, okay? It's just a few days. It's kind of like what I showed you for Hurricane Matthew, said more, more intense because it was a much bigger rain event. This just shows you that the, uh, our rainfall data from that particular time, um, we had 10 inches of rain at one of our sites, the Jensen Beach site seven inches of rain at our crossroads site. And over the whole rainfall event, we had 16 inches, 12 inches of rain. And I, some of you who lived here that September will remember the flooding that was occurring nearby. So that's just the information on that. Now this is just taking that same graph and just blowing it up a little bit more. And that's what I just talked about. So the Army Corps started discharging right here. And you can see, just like here, how quickly these sites go to zero. So this is the St. Lucie Estuary Crossroads site. And, uh, and you can see this is near the inlet. You can see the salinity stay pretty high. But even there, they're depressed. But you can see all the other stations just basically go to zero. Then periodically, the Army Corps would modify the discharges, and you start to see some return to salinities. Every time they increase the discharges, so here, for example, and here, you can see there's a, there's a significant drop in salinity and how quickly it occurs. So the way South Florida and Central Florida is plumbed is that things happen very quickly. The whole goal is to get rid of fresh water off our lands, avoid flooding. This is when the Army Corps stopped, okay? So um, that that's, was 270 days of discharge, uh, which is not the longest discharge, but it was certainly one of the longest ones. It started very early in the year um, because it was such a wet year. And this is the total amount, or estimated amount, of water discharge. There's a lot of silt and sediment, a.k.a. turbidity, a lot of nitrogen, a lot of phosphorus that's coming from those discharges. So now I want to show you, and during those blooms, and the blooms peaked around the end of June and July. So again, I just took a snippet of the record a month when most of this was really happening. This is when CNN was here, and um, a lot of the national, international, and local media were all over it. Uh, this, again, is our site, and I can just reference these for you. So this is our St. Lucie Crossroads site. So you can see this is the up and down of the tides near the inlet. Uh, ocean salinities are about 35, but you can see even there, ocean salinities drop below 20 at times because of all the fresh water coming down out this way, going out the inlet. And you can see that salinities were very low at all of the other St. Lucie estuary sites interior here. So they are always here. Uh, I'm showing you the five part per thousand mark. And the reason I show you five parts per thousand is because that cyanobacterium, microcystis, can live up to five parts per thousand. So my point is that most of the time, for most of the summer, this period of time, 
it was great conditions. And so, in fact, the, unlike some other years where the cyanobacteria would die upon hitting saltier water, um, here they actually were surviving and actually able to grow for sustained periods of time in the, in the uh, estuary. So because of these discharges from C44, we had very low salinities, which was favorable for the growth of that basically freshwater alga in, a, in an estuarine system. What about things like turbidity? So turbidity, again, are those particles. And these two sites here that are highest are here, the South Fork stations. Okay? And basically what we're seeing is that they have much elevated levels of turbidity, again, due to the discharges. So again, using this technology, you can actually go back and tease out you know, what overall impacts are coming related to certain types of uh, events such as discharges. What about phosphate? So phosphate is one of the nutrients. And again, this gets kind of busy a little bit perhaps, but uh, from top to bottom, the, the, the top spot is North Fork up here, so the upper part. And remember, the, the discharges come to the South Fork from the C44. So the South Fork is actually further down here. So the bottom line is that we're actually, during that period of discharge, we're actually getting higher phosphorus flow from the north, not from the south. So it's not really as high from the Lake Okeechobee discharge as, as it is from local watershed. That's an important take-home message, not what a lot of people think. Let's tease this down a little bit further. And this now is looking at um, phosphate just at South Fork, so just the station right here. And you can see um, this is the depth, so high tide, low tide, high tide, low tide. And if you look carefully at the pattern, high tide, low tide, high phosphate, low phosphate. High phosphate at high tide, not low tide. That suggests that the elevated phosphate in this area here is actually coming from here, from the North Fork, not the South Fork. And you can also uh, look at the phosphate level up here, and you can look for that same pattern, high tide, and so here's high tide, so on. And what you actually see is that we have higher phosphate um, here uh, at low tide. Okay, again, that's suggesting that once this water is flowing out down here, most of the phosphate, or the, the greater portion of this, is coming actually from local watershed. So, st short story three. What about this year? What about drought? What about today? So this is from the weekend, and I just did this over the weekend, of course. Um, and I think we all know that now Florida is in a major drought. This is the Orlando Sentinel. This is another report. Significant drought relief to remain absent across Florida into mid-April. It's actually projected to be further. Yesterday's local papers all talked about the drought and all talked about the fire hazards that are coming. This is um, a graph from uh, another sensing program that looks at basically um, soil moisture. And you can see here's the index. You can see this really sharp line where, you know, Georgia and the Panhandle, you know, they do not have a drought index. There's major differences in rainfall so far this year. And as you can see, as you, as you go further down, we're in the area of the state where the drought um, levels are highest. So the soil is uh, driest, and that's why we have so many more probabilities of uh, wildfires uh, this year. And some of you may remember previous years where we've had some significant closures of 95 and so on when we've had, we've had fire problems. So that's what's going to happen this year. So let's take that same record. And I talked about that little rain event. I talked about the beginning of opening up Lake Okeechobee and 279 days later. Here's what happened um, when it closed. Look how quickly the low salinities all the way up to those locks became an estuary again. Look how fast. Look what's happened. Look what's happened up here. Look at how that variability has greatly declined. So this is um, some of my final graphs. So I said, let's compare February and March a year ago. So those discharges started right at the beginning of February, end of January, beginning of February. Let's look at the first two months of last year's situation, and let's compare the first two months of now. So this is the St. Lucie Estuary. This is, these are our stations. This is nearest the inlet. You can see high-low, high-low, just like I showed you before. It's the same data. And you can see that how depressed it was right away and you had basically a totally freshwater system here for a good part of February. Okay? So our exact same sites, what does it look like now? Now, you don't need to be a scientist to say 
This is different than this, right? Anybody think there's no difference? Okay, let's take a look at this. Um, to me, you can start either way. Um, let's start down here. This is um, the South Fork Station. This is the one right next to the locks. This was always zero here. You can't really even see it most of the time. So even that upper reach of the South Fork has salinities between 15 and 20 parts per thousand most of the time. Most of our other sites are between 25 and 30. Those are excellent water quality conditions for an estuary anywhere, but in Florida, it's excellent conditions. And then let's even go to the inland. We think, well, it was always salty here. We always had some ocean water. But look how much less variability we had. So what we're having here is we're having a much more stable salinity environment. So things that live near the inlet, that's what they prefer. And you get a lot of ocean reef species that come in and out the inlet. And this is much more favorable conditions than these are over here. OK, so what a difference uh, you know, this year has made. And so I'm excited because um, all predictions are we'll have drought going on until the wet season. We don't know how wet the wet season is going to be. It might be what we call a dry wet season. So you can follow this you know, yourselves but just by going on to our website. That was down by the St. Lucie Estuary. That's our, our southern site. Let's look at our northern site, the ones right here in Indian River County and St. Lucie County. Again, this is the way it was a year ago. This one's a lot busier than the other one. But this is Fort Pierce going up and down, up and down, and so on. And let's compare it snapshot to now. And you can see even here, and Lake Okeechobee discharges never, never get here. They never get north of Fort Pierce. But you can see the same story that I said about the inlet station. So this is down near Fort Pierce. You can see how much more stable the salinities were at our more oceanic site. You can see how much more stable they were at all the sites and how much more elevated they were. And you can see that they actually are in more, much more favorable salinity ranges than they were a year ago. So overall, water quality conditions is much better this year than last year. But did it have anything to do with any of the activities of any of our management plans or anything? No. This is all tied to how much it rains and how much water gets discharged down the canals that we live on. That's, that's what this is. So when you start to read, oh, everything's better in the lagoon, it's because we are having less freshwater in, impacts. And when we go back to having a wet year, I think it's safe to predict that we'll see some of the same situations that we saw in 2016 and 2013 again. It's very predictable. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get more predictivity, predictability in our, in our work here. And I think just these two data sets, these last two shot slides, tell you what a tremendous climate related. And by climate, I don't mean climate change. I just mean last year it was wet. This year it's dry. That's how much interannual variability we have. So for people like me who want to understand the lagoon and how it works, we have to factor in that one year it's like this, one year it's like that. Another year it's going to be different. And that's the real challenge. And that's the real value of having the data set. But sometimes, you know, you can have too much water. And you don't know what data you want to drink out of that data set, right? So one of our really big challenges, but I always see opportunity when I say challenge, so to go together, is how are we going to take just what we want? And so we're developing a comprehensive database. I mentioned Brian and Kristen earlier. They're doing most of the work on that and um, related products. The products will be things that scientists could use, but managers could use. It might be a different type of data set, and the general public can use. And again, you're, you may be looking for something different than what we're looking on. We want to be develop better visualization tool for all these users so you can get it the way you want it and so that you can understand it. And I think we also need to spend more time telling stories. So I decided, well, I'm going to tell three stories today. And we also, consistent with that, um, redid our website for this program, uh, ERLO, in the Lagoon Observatory. And you can check it out. You can just Google IRLO, and you'll get there, especially if you say HBY, IRL, you'll get there. And we have a series of, um, you know, people might call them blogs. And we call them Indian River Lagoon observations, because actually we're an observatory. And we periodically write little stories that you can go online and read. And these are also distributed through our uh, Harbor Branch social media. And I actually brought some PDFs of this if you want to take a look, just because you want to read a little bit more about any of the three things I told you about. Um, we have some things there for you. 
So last words. Um, you know, I've given a bunch of talks in the lecture series. Some of you may remember where I did Kermit the Frog. I invoked Kermit the Frog a couple times. Uh, I've invoked uh, Einstein, but actually it was Walter Matthau's version of Einstein. And I like to have quotes sometimes in my title. And everyone said, what's your quote mean? You know, you could talk about anything. Well, of course, that was the idea when I came up with the title is I didn't know what exactly I was going to talk about yet. But actually, the quote comes from Yogi Bear. And so if you know anything about yogiisms, you can observe a lot by just watching. And I thought, this is the first week of baseball season. And let's go with Yogi. There you go.